Well, here we are in Pune, and many of you will recognize what I'm, what you see on the screen behind us now. This is one of the most spectacular mountain ranges of the country, the Sahyadris or the Western Ghats, comparable only to the Himalaya. This mountain range spans over 1,600 kilometers, starting in central India at the Tapi River. And extending all the way down to the southernmost tip of the Indian Peninsula in Kerala, it is believed to have originated nearly a hundred million years ago, when the tectonic plate, Indian plate, separated and started its journey northward. This is the time when the volcanic activity started, and the upliftment of the Himal of the Sahyadri started. The Western Ghats are divided into two biogeographic zones. The first being the Northern Western Ghats, which pass through Gujarat, Maharashtra, and Goa, and the second part, which is the Southern part, which is the Southern Western Ghats, which travel across Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, and Kerala. They get torrential rains. They pre present a formidable climate barrier to peninsular India. And they are the source region of some of the longest Indian Peninsula rivers, the Krishna, the Godavari, the Kaveri, the Tungabhadra, and many others, which flow towards the east. The Northern Western Ghats also hold the historic legacy of the Great Maratha Empire, with some of the most formidable forts in the country. Are found in the northern Western Ghats. Who have trekked? How many of you here have trekked in the Himalayas? I can see a lot of hands up, and this is one of the most favorite trekking spots in the country. Millions of years of evolution have created a phenomenal diversity in the flora and the fauna, which live in these thick, dense forests. Which are interspersed with grasslands and rocky outcrops. So this forms the mosaic of habitats which you see on the Sahyadri. And this evolution has given rise to what scientists believe as 5,500 different types of flowering plants, of which nearly 500 are endemic to the Western Ghats. Which means they are unique. They are found nowhere else on the planet. They are only found in the Western Ghats. And we have nearly 16,000 fauna, including insects. And of that, around 4,200 are endemic, unique only to the Sahyadris. The mountains, together with the living organisms, create some of the most vital ecosystem services that the country needs. The torrential rains of the Sahyadri wither the basalt rocks, which are created by volcanic explosions. They release the minerals and they create fantastic soil, which has reached right up to the Bay of Bengal. The mountains allow the rains to get into, percolate into the groundwater. They recharge the basins. They recharge the deck and traps. These mountains capture a phenomenal amount of carbon continuously throughout the year, and the 4,000 millimeters of rain that this mountain range gets is divided into two areas. One half of the rainfall. Drains into the Arabian Sea, and the other half drains into the Bay of Bengal, creating some of the most magnificent rivers that we have in the peninsular India. This mountain range alone irrigates nearly 40 percent of peninsular India. And the best part of it, no government has paid even a single rupee for any of these services. We uh, we are getting these services free of cost. However. If I tell you something is not right, you will be shocked. The forests of the Sahyadri are no longer forests of Sahyadri. Some of the most important dense forests are turning into grasslands, which are seasonal. Sahyadris are burning. These are actual pictures taken from Sahyadris from the districts of Kolhapur and Satara. 
these are not wildfires. They are not natural. They are lit by human beings. They are lit by villagers who are living in around 600 to 800 meters altitudes of the Sahyadris. These fires are lit every year and they spread far and wide. And they are turning the Sahyadris black. We don't see the green, we don't see the forest. They are turning into grasslands. So what happens in forest fires? Many things which are not quite visible to us. The first and foremost is what happens to the slow moving insects. They simply roast away in these fires. They are completely extinguished from the entire landscape. And if the insects are lost, the birds don't come there. And if the birds don't come, the land, the soil doesn't get their valuable poop, which brings seeds of native trees, and which has been doing, this has been happening over millions of years, and we are losing these ecosystem services. The soil microbiota, the microorganisms which live in the soil, which are extremely essential to provide the inorganic nutrients to the vegetation of the Sahyadri, that is lost. Habitats are destroyed. Saplings which have regenerated in one season are lost completely. And the food chain simply goes away. This is creating a loss of the specialist species of the Sahyadri. The Malabar whistling thrush, the numerous flycatchers, the giant Indian squirrel, they find better homes. They just stay away from the landscape. And who, is, who, are, who replaces them? The urban dwellers, the kites, the crows, the minas, and the bulbuls. This is what we start finding in those altitudes. And this is what intrigued us at the Center for Sustainable Development in Gokhale Institute. We were wanted to know who was lighting these fires? Do they know the repercussions of their actions? Do they know what happens if they light a fire? And why are they lighting a fire? With these questions in mind, we studied 20 villages in that particular altitude range of 600 meters to 800 meters across the two districts of Kolhapur and Satara. Our study lasted about a year. And we found some very interesting and shocking patterns. The first thing that we realized is that human beings have been living in these mountains and at certain altitudes for nearly 10,000 years when human beings got into settled agriculture. And traditionally, there are two types of farming which are done in these mountains. The first is the valley farming, where they take one rain-fed paddy crop, which gives them their income. And the second is after the rain-fed paddy crop is taken, they also do slope farming. And slope farming is essentially subsistence farming. It's for themselves. They grow millets, they grow pulses, they grow some vegetables, and that feeds the family and keeps some food for worst times. Our study saw several patterns in these hills. The first most important pattern is all these 20 villages were aging. There were no youth remaining. They all migrated to cities for income. Mumbai, Pune, Kolhapur, Sangli, and the Konkan. That's where the job lie, and that's where the youth want to go. The second pattern which we saw is that slope farming in the Sayadris was almost nearly over. It was abandoned. Nobody was doing it. The third interesting pattern was the livestock population in these villages was growing at a very fast rate. And the fourth is the fires are lit around the month of February. This was really intriguing. And we were talking to villagers, we were talking to senior people, we were talking to uh, youth, and we were gathering data, we were collecting data. We realized that there is something behind these patterns. And we had to get to the root cause of the problem. We saw three main root causes of the problem. First is that slope farming is very difficult. And the aging couple, the senior citizens of the village, they cannot farm on the slopes. They have abandoned it. The second root cause we saw 
is that there is a growing demand for dairy products, milk. And there were several new cooperative dairies which have come up. They send a milk van every day to these villages and they pick up whatever milk the aging couple has produced and they get cash every day. So it's a relatively easy source of income compared to slope farming. And the third thing we saw is around February, these grasses turn unpalatable. The cattle don't want to eat it and that's the time when the villagers light the fire. This fire burns down the unpalatable grasses, puts the ash into the soil, the or inorganic matter goes back into the soil, and with the moisture in the soil, residual moisture, there is another flush of grass which comes up, which lasts them for a couple of weeks. After that, the villagers have to buy their fodder. So the fires are essentially a postponement to buying fodder. And that is when we made a shocking realization that these were the root causes, but the driver was something else. The, f the, the responsibility of the fires lies not with the villagers, but with the changing urban diets. The demand for paneer, for shrikhand, for rasgullas and cheese, urban diets, is what was driving the fires. The reason of the fires are sitting in this very room. Up, about 13% is the year-on-year -year growth on dairy food products, not milk. We don't consume more milk than we used to when we were a kid. We consume more dairy products, and that is driving up the thing. So urban diets were driving the dairy industry. Dairy industry was driving milk production. Milk production was driving fodder industry. And fodder was driving the fires. This was very scary. We wanted to work on this. But the way we analyzed this is we looked at the, the forest fires. We could appeal to the villagers. We could detect the fires, we could douse them, we could install alarm systems. But then, we were treating the symptoms, not the problem. So we observed the problems, we observed the patterns, and we said we will not work on treating the symptoms. We'll work on treating the problems. We went to the root causes, we established the root causes, our hypothesis, we got it tested by talking to dairies, by talking to senior citizens, by talking to experts. We looked at the drivers, and finally comes the point of solution. We identified the levers that could make a change in the fires of the Sahyadri. And we saw four levers that could potentially change these fires. The first is, go back and talk to villagers, tell them what you're doing is not right, it's not good for the Sahyadris. The second is urban folk. Go out and tell them, stop eating paneer. <laughs> Both these levers look ridiculous, and they are, because I cannot tell people what they can eat and what they cannot. The villagers already know what's happening to the Sahyadris. They don't need to be told. And I, from the city, cannot tell them, you stop making your livelihood and stop burning. So the only two levers of change that we saw is the youth and the dairies. And they were really potential. Why are the youth migrating in the first place? Lack of incomes, lack of jobs, lack of livelihoods. And the cities provide all of that. We knew that there were successful businesses all across the Sihadri. We went back right from Bhima Shankar to the southernmost point of Maharashtra and we looked at all the successful businesses that youth were doing in these parts. We identified tussar silk farming, honeybee rearing, bamboo, millet-based value-added products, and so many others like medicinal plants. We documented the cases, we wrote down the case studies, we took their bites, we created web resources, we created everything, we created a documentary. And we had a three sutri formula for the youth. The first sutra was aggregation. Doing business alone in the Sanyadris is absolutely formidable. 
But if you come together, if you make a farmer produce a company, you can get economies of scale. Your input costs get lower. Your aggregated output can get better prices. Your cost of sales comes down. So coming together, aggregation was the first in the Tri Sutra. The second was conservation. All these livelihoods were from non-timber forest produced, NTFP. And that is what nature was giving them. And therefore, you had to conserve nature to do these businesses. And youth are realizing this. And the third formula is value addition. Stop selling what you produce, but add value to it. And that will give you more profitability. That will make the product more lasting. And that is what cities are demanding today. The youths absolutely realize this. And they are now thinking of coming back. To the dairies. We can't go back and say, stop fires, fires. The only thing which we can show is higher profitability. And the first question we asked the dairies, are you happy with the quality of the milk that you received today? And the answer was almost unanimous. No, we are not. And do you, know, do you realize why you're not? Absolutely. Traditionally, the pastoral communities did not feed their livestock only for, for grasses. It was supplemented by broad, broadleaf fodder plant-based fodder and that is when we told them that can we create nurseries in the Sanyadri of native endemic palatable trees and start planting them that is input for the villagers and that they realize this with the better quality of fodder you get better quality of milk and the better quality of milk is beneficial not just to the dairies, but also to the farmers who get a higher price for their milk. Today they get something like 21 rupees per, per liter. With higher quality of milk, there'll be more profitable products for the dairies. And businessmen can see profits and they agree to it. Today, the Mission Sahyadri runs across 80 villages. We are going out and training the youth not just in the villages, but also in cities like Pune and Mumbai, where we are showing them how successful businesses need to be run in the Sanyadris. They are realizing that. We are trying to arrest the fires of the Sanyadri with the local communities. It's not an easy task. The goal is not near. But we are doing this because every forest matters. Thank you. <laughs>